So, were you both at the station when, when it happened? Yeah. It was on night GC, so um, when it happened, it was obviously sort of ready to uh, go straight away. So, you actually um, realised there was a shout or a call before it, the calls came through because the, you heard the explosion up the hill, basically. So. so, did everyone hear the explosion happen then? Yeah, yeah. I personally, I don't know about Brent, but I, I thought it was a plane crash initially when I heard the initial explosion. One of our colleagues who was on the upper floor at the time came running down the stairs and, and he, he, could see, he could see basically the, the glow in the sky and put two and two together and knew it was Bunsfield and so he, uh, he let us know that as he went through didn't he? Yeah, shouting and screaming through the station so um, yeah, on the tip out we actually left the station before, before the bells went down, normally we got the bells to go down for uh, an instant so just making our way up the hill and just right up the right. Um, as we saw the huge fireball at the top of the, uh, the top of the road, and again, we weren't sure if the plane went down, or the house explosion, or no, we weren't sure at first. Um, we carried on up, and we realised obviously it was Bunsfield, and yeah, everything changed a little bit. It <laughs> gets a bit very serious. So. What was the atmosphere like in the fire engine? Was everyone scared, or? Funny enough, me, me and Kevin talked about this morning. Um, we kind of there's a lot of experienced hands on Blue Watch back then. Um, yeah. And all of us were kind of looking at each other for some sort of inspiration of what we could do because it was just something that's uh, so huge. So, um, let's put the game faces back on, I guess, and sort of uh, just go like, right to, back to the basics with procedures and sort of start from there and deal with what we, what we had. Sort of. And it was declared sort of a major incident before you even got there, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, kept on the pump actually of our sub officer at the time, John Batchelor. Um, there's not been many uh, major incidents uh, declared on the way there before and yeah, we've done it as we're on, on the to uh, What did it look like when you got there? Could you see fire or was it just some smoke? It was carnage. Uh, to be honest, even before our arrival, going through the industrial estate, uh, so many buildings had been either extensively damaged or destroyed from the initial explosion. But even getting to the site itself was... Uh, it was a bit of a drama because uh, it, was, it was just carnage everywhere as soon as you got into Maylands Avenue. So it's kind of thread our way through the debris of the buildings where it literally ripped through the buildings before we were safe before we even got to the site. It's one of those sort of moments, I guess, where you, uh, time sort of slows down a little bit. You're trying to process everything you're seeing. There's like, yeah. like Kevin was saying, there's roofs of buildings scattered across the road. I'm actually trying to drive the pump around the debris on the road and seeing this huge fireball behind and all of the warehouses blown out in front of us. As, uh, and were explosions still going off while you were there? Yeah, yeah, there was um, two or three, I think. Yeah, at least, yeah, yeah. The, the initial explosion which involved the petrol tank and the subsequent explosions involved with the ad gas. So, yeah, when we got there, um, as you rightly asked, yeah, explosions were still occurring for uh, a little bit of a time, probably another 35, 40 minutes or so, there were still tanks that were coming involved. And were you, so you were the first fire engine that actually showed up? Yeah, that's right. Was that quite a lot of pressure to sort of know that you had to deal with it first? Well, there's only so much you can do on something of that scale, to be honest. And we've got a predetermined rendezvous point that we attend. Uh, and, and Brent and I, just as, as we were approaching that with the, with the appliance, there was walking wounded that were coming towards us from the site. Oh, yeah. So they were our primary concern, was dealing with them, making sure that, you know, that the injuries uh, weren't significant and, and doing what we could for them. And, and trying to get information from them as well as to who else was on site. So were these workers on site that got injured then? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. It was really the first by a gentleman um, and he you had know, sort of blood around his face for the impact of the, the amount of vacuum from the explosion sort of perforated his eardrums. Oh, um, God. He told us that there were six people missing. So yeah. primarily our first thing we had to do was to try and do a very quick sweep uh, search of the buildings, see if we can find anyone and that was a, that was a strange situation. We got all the uh, bin the compound itself was completely different offices from the different uh, oil companies. And um, going into it, must, you know, I sort of have visions of what it must have been like in 9 11 to a certain extent. If the, the ceilings all come down, doors are all moved off the frames, you know, you're just going in with an axe and a, sort of a, a sledgehammer trying to get the way through the buildings. And um, I vividly remember actually going into where, the, uh, where they would um, do the mechanical work on the tankers because there was a pit along the floor and that was completely full up with water. And there was water spraying everywhere, obviously where the, the uh, water main had ruptured within that building. And again, it's just one of those situations where the sort of time went very still for a little while, and just sort of taking it all in, and you see this huge fireball again, and sort of and carrying on with the searches. And yeah, it was a real surreal <laughs> experience. Yeah, much, yeah. so, so it must be the biggest thing you've ever attended. Oh yeah, without brain. a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, it, it's been it's been documented as the biggest uh, fire in peacetime Europe, and yeah, uh, yeah certainly it's it's it's. it's uh, it's a, it's a once in a career time thing.
for sure. Do younger firefighters ask you about it when they join? Are they interested in how you dealt with it? Yeah. Yeah, you do get questions. There's a few photos around the station because it's obviously we're the primary station where it puts, it starts sending crews up there. So um, yeah, some of the photos we've got around the station have got uh, a pretty good interest, and people always comment on, on those and ask what it's about. Yeah. How long were you both on site for then from getting there? Yeah, on that particular occasion, the call was uh, around about six o'clock in the morning, and uh, we were there till oh, I can't even recall mid afternoon, something yeah. like that, wasn't it? And then. Obviously, coming on duty subsequently thereafter for a number of days, and then into the weeks of the fire itself, we we, we got under uh, control in about three days. But then it's a case of dealing with the aftermath and, and the environment side of it. Yeah. Weeks, so, yeah. That must have been quite worrying for your families, knowing that you were out there dealing with it. Yeah, yeah possibly, <laughs> possibly. Yeah, uh, when they're getting live news feeds and stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of our, a lot of us, um, our families live within the area. They did sort of on the crew that was there, so everyone had been woken up by the huge explosion, and yeah, our phones are ringing all the time, make sure we're, we're okay. And obviously, it's been broadcast live on, on TV, so um, yeah, it probably was a bit of a concern, but it was okay after.